Last week, I went to the funeral of a good friend of mine's mum. Margaret was remembered as a loving and stoic Scotswoman, but her family also reflected on how awful her last years had been. Her body had become so frail and her mind was ravaged by dementia, which left her really distressed and fearful. Afterwards, at the wake, we were all saying to each other how cruel ageing can be. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a better way for humans to get older? Well, Andrew Steele believes that there is. Andrew has a PhD in physics from the University of Oxford, but he switched from physics to biology because he wanted to focus on ageing. Andrew thinks ageing is the most important scientific challenge of our time. His book is Ageless, The New Science of Getting Older Without Getting Old. Hi, Andrew. Hello, how are you doing? Just saying that, Andrew, you know, it's strange to think of ageing as a scientific challenge. I'd assumed it was just a fact of life, you know, if we're lucky. It is. And this is um, sort of a revelation that happened to me toward the end of my PhD. I think it's so easy to see ageing as just this sort of inevitable backdrop against which our lives take place. But actually, well, I changed career because of a graph. I tell people this, and it's, it's sort of glib, but it's not that glib. I'm very statistically driven. And that graph was the graph of uh, human risk of death with time. So it was a bit of a morbid reason to change career. And this graph shows that human risk of death doubles about every seven or eight years. So you start out in your 30s, um, say, with a risk of death somewhere less than one in a thousand per year. And it's worth just thinking about what that means. Like if that were to continue, you'd live into your thousand and thirties on average. But obviously that doesn't continue because your risk doubles every seven or eight years or so. By the time you're in your 80s, your risk of death is about one in 20. By the time you're in your 90s, your risk of death can be one in six. So, you know, you're 92, your chance of not making your 93rd birthday is basically determined by the roll of a dice. And obviously that can be a bit morbid, can be a bit terrifying. But what it really said to me as a scientist was there must be some underlying process that's driving this incredible uh, increase in the risk of death and also the increase in the risk of, you know, frailty, vision loss, hearing loss, all this other stuff that's happening at the same time. And if we could drill down into that process, maybe we could, you know, come up with some incredible medicines that could really change late life. Do you remember how you came across that graph? I mean, what what were you Googling for that to appear before your eyes? I think it was about Christmas 2010. And I think uh, yeah, maybe maybe trying to avoid chatting to the family too much or something. I'm not sure. But, you know, it's all right. Just, I mean, she's only got another five years around. It's OK. I'm working out the stats of how much longer I have to have Christmas with these people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I just you know got basically stuck down an internet rabbit hole. And I, I, the other exciting thing isn't just to see that graph, of course. That's just grim on its own, really, frankly, isn't it? The thing that's exciting is that I also started reading about all these breakthroughs in aging science that show us that we can do something about it and it's really the combination of this sort of you know tragedy encapsulated in this graph coupled with the fact that science you know we have various ways to slow and reverse aging in the lab and actually in the intervening sort of decade or so since I first started reading about this so much more has been learned I just thought this was the most exciting thing I could possibly work on. You had just finished a PhD in physics though I mean that's a big (laughs) that's a big thing to walk away from. Yeah, and it's it's quite unusual actually. Even within, um, you know, say within physics, it's quite unusual for people to switch between fields in that sense. Let alone to switch to an entirely new one. Um, so that was a bit of a challenge. I, I decided to try and follow the route of computational biology. So I've never been in a wet lab. I've never used PET. But what I do, what I did do when I was working as a biologist was um, analyze huge data sets. And so I took some of the sort of mathematical and programming training I got from my physics and tried to apply it to biology. Um, but yeah, as you say, it can be a, a bit of a leap. There was an awful lot to learn. I, I stopped studying biology officially at the age of 16. So I had to, you know, acquaint myself with a whole lot of new information. Tell me a little bit about what was sparking your curiosity back when you were when you were a kid, Andrew? It was definitely physics. My mum says that I was, I, I told her that I wanted to be a physicist age something like seven or eight, because it was the only science that really explained everything. And I think that the thing that drew me, I mean, and this is true of a lot of scientists that you speak to, I was drawn in by astronomy. I'd look up at the night sky and especially after the age of about 10, we moved into the countryside. And so, you know, you could see the Milky Way from our back garden. And I think just, you know, being under that canopy of stars really makes you think there's something you know, much bigger than us and incredible. I really wanted to study and understand. So that's what drew me into physics. And then, as I say, you know, as I went through my studies, I suddenly got sort of pulled away by this big humanitarian pull to try and move into a different field. Did you know many old people when you were growing up? I mean, you were someone who had grandparents or other older people in your life? I was thinking about this as I was writing the book because many of us can sort of go for the first five or even six decades of life without really confronting what ageing is. So my, my mother's parents were both dead before I was born. They both died of lung cancer because they were heavy smokers. 
and on my dad's side, I did have grandparents, but I, th- I think they were sort of, they were wrinkly, they were kindly, they gave me a lot of chocolate, you know, these are the sorts of things I remember as a kid, I, you know, I loved spending time with them. But I don't think I was really exposed to the, the frailty that they were experiencing. And, in, you know, in recent years, my, my, gran, my granny is the one that's still alive now. She's, she's 90 something. I'm not exactly entirely sure how old she is, but she's, she's really starting to you know, suffer from her old age now. And I think that's really sort of underlined to me you know, what, what aging is. But even then, I'm surprisingly insulated. Right? My mum um, does a lot of the looking after. You know, she's, she's basically a remote support service for my granny. And so I get all this information secondhand. But I can just imagine for a lot of people, it's so easy to, you know, get into your 30s or 40s or even your 50s. And until your own parents start getting old, maybe, or you know, until something draws you into that care. Um, the statistic I found that was most striking about this was there was a US survey, and it's quite old now. I think it was from 2003. But I can't imagine the numbers have changed that much. It said that the average care for somebody aged 65 or older is 63 themselves so what that means is it's a lot of spouses caring for each other it's a lot of you know basically parents caring for grandparents sort of thing rather than you know people in their 30s you know we're busy we've got careers we've got kids we've got all sorts of stuff going on so I think you can just avoid it for an extended period of time and honestly my direct experience of aging is is relatively low comparatively i think i've really been drawn into it from sort of a this very dry statistical perspective well once you started getting drawn into this this field of aging you look at animals non-human animals as well as human animals and i want to Mm. talk to you about tortoises now the australian zoo in queensland was the last home of a tortoise called harriet who died at around 175 in 2006 where had she come from originally so the story is that Darwin, um, when he was travelling around on the Beagle, went to the Galapagos Islands. And the Galapagos Islands are actually really pivotal in his ultimate formulation of the theory of evolution, because there's just this absolutely wonderful diversity of fascinating species. And one of the really amazing animals you find on Galapagos are these enormous tortoises. And so the story goes that he uh, collected this tortoise, Harriet, as a relatively young tortoise brought her back to England, and then by some slightly unclear um, means, she ended up on Australia, where she you know, lived for, well, we think, as you say, to about 175, 177, depending on how you age her. But actually, sort of beneath the story, as I was trying to research this, it gets surprisingly controversial, because Darwin never visited the island on which Harriet's species resides. However, he did visit a prison island in the Galapagos, and those prisoners would go out to other islands and collect tortoises to eat. So that's thought to be how he ended up with the tortoise. There's some other controversy that maybe Harriet isn't actually one of Darwin's tortoises and she came to Australia by a different... It just became so phenomenally complicated. I thought I'd stick to sort of the simple canonical <laughs> version because the historical complexity there was just astonishing. Well, there's no debate around the fact that tortoises live to what seem a very great age. And what's mm. special or unusual about the way that tortoises age? I think that's that's the thing you've got to concentrate on because, you know, Harriet lived to 175, which obviously sounds incredibly old to us. But you could argue tortoises, they're cold blooded. They have a very slow metabolism. Perhaps it's just the case that they're living more slowly in some biological sense than we are. And that's what allows them to you know live longer than us. But what's really exciting about Galapagos tortoises and a number of other species is that they're something called negligibly senescent. And what that means is that their risk of death doesn't change with time. So I mentioned back at the beginning that humans' risk of death doubles every seven or eight years. But tortoises, they, you know, they've got about a one or two percent risk of death every year in adulthood. And so they just carry on with that self-same risk of death, you know, potentially, you know, up to 200 years old. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and not only that, their, you know, their risk of death doesn't change, but they don't become any more frail. They don't tend to lose their faculties. They're even reproducing right up to the very, very end of their lives. So it seems as though in a... Yeah, in a sort of statistical biological sense, they just don't age. Well, so then what kills them if they're not ageing in the way that we usually understand that term to mean? Well, what Harriet do they die of? A, yeah, Harriet died of a heart attack. And I think, you know, the, 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 the thing to think about with all of this stuff, when, you know, when you talk about, I, I talk about curing ageing, and what I really mean by that is I'd like humans to be like tortoises, be negligibly senescent. But the fact is that I think we'll just die of the same things, but it'll be deferred until later in life. So Harriet, as I said, died of a heart attack, um, but she just happened to do so at 175 rather than 75. So I think, you know, the, the way to think about it is it's the same stuff that eventually catches up with you. It just takes longer to do so, and it's a less painful process getting there. Are they unique tortoises in, in having this quality of, of not really aging of of there not being that that change over time they're not no and i think actually it's probably more common than we know so to to list a few species that we do know there are a few other kinds of tortoise there are some kinds of salamander um there are some fish that we think are negligibly senescent and there's a little tiny creature called a hydra this tiny um 
it's a it's a pond dwelling thing about a centimetre long. And what's most amazing about them, what first drew them to the attention of scientists is that you can cut basically any bit off a hydra and you'll just get a second hydra. They've got these incredible regenerative powers. But according to the mortality we've observed over the time we've been watching them, we think that about 10% of these hydra would still be alive after a thousand years. <laughs> um, so... And what, what really fascinated me, like looking into this stuff, you realise how challenging it is to do these experiments. Because if you want to determine that a tortoise is negligibly senescent, you basically have to watch loads of tortoises for decades and decades, you know, ideally centuries, in order to you know, properly nail down the demographics of these species. So I think it's quite likely there are other animals out there that are negligibly senescent that we just, you know, ecologists haven't got around to surveying yet. You need a whole family of scientists where it's sort of carried on down the line to keep studying the same yeah. one or two animals. So what about humans? If you and I, Andrew, were sitting around chatting around a fire about this subject mm. back in the earliest days of our species, how long were we likely to still be around for? It's a very tough question because obviously we don't have any actual demographic data from those times. You have to sort of infer it from things like, you know, hunter-gatherer communities now or various bones that are found at archaeological sites and that kind of thing. But what we think is that prehistoric life expectancy was somewhere around 30 or 35 years old. The reason that um, the life expectancy was so low is primarily because of terrible infant and child mortality. So there was probably something like a 60-40 chance, so only just better than the toss of a coin, that you'd make it until you were 15 or 20 years old. And that's because, you, you know, you might get infection, you might die in birth. There were just all kinds of, you know, congenital problems that obviously early humans had no understanding of at all. But if you were lucky enough, you know, to basically your coin came up heads and you made it to your 20s, then the remaining life expectancy, as it's called, was probably like 30 or 40 years, which means that the average human who made it into adulthood in those times might have lived to you know, maybe 50, maybe 60, maybe, you know, and again, that's an average. So you'd expect a few early humans to have even made it into their 70s or 80s, perhaps, you know, what we in modern times would start to call old. So this headline sort of 30, 35 year life expectancy is actually telling us about, you know, it, it masks two things. It masks the terrible toll of infant mortality, but it also masks how long a handful of the early humans would probably have lived. When did this story about longevity in our species start to change? It's amazing how long it uh, remained consistent for, actually. Because if you, if you look at the sort of mortality statistics, even by the time you get to the beginning of the 19th century, then basically that number, that headline, you know, 30, 35 years, was pretty much unchanged in most parts of the world. At the beginning of the included, 19th century? Yeah. Wow. So, you know, imagine you're moving, you know, you're in England, you're moving to a, one of these newly industrialising cities. You know, you obviously wouldn't be being killed on a hunt or you wouldn't, you know, th there was a different spectrum of infectious diseases that were killing you. But effectively, you know, life expectancy overall was very much un unchanged. But what happens after that is this absolutely remarkable increase in human life expectancy. Starting from about the 1830s, if you look at the top performing country in the world, you can sort of imagine that as the state of the art of human life expectancy, then that has been increasing by three months a year, every year, like clockwork since about 1830. And it's that, that, that progress is still going on today. And it's, it's almost suspicious, you know, because as a scientist, you don't expect to see straight line trends absolutely everywhere. And yet this graph is just absolutely, you know, rock steady, completely straight, even though the sort of the complex tangle of social and economic and healthcare and you know all these different factors that are contributing to that have obviously been shifting massively over time and yet every year three months TikTok <laughs> it's just remarkable. Is that restricted though to the wealthy first world that that line upwards? If you'd asked me this question thirty years ago, there would have been you know a much bigger disparity, but it's really remarkable. Another thing that's really remarkable is is just how fast the developing world is catching up. So if you, if you were to look in the 1950s, I think the highest life expectancy in the world was somewhere in the region of 70 years. And yet if you look at somewhere like India, its life expectancy was about 36. And yet if you fast forward to today, then the highest life expectancies in the world are now up in the sort of 80, 85 region, whereas India's life expectancy is 69. And actually, I ask people to guess what global life expectancy is. And I've already given it away a bit by telling you what India's is, and that sort of gives you a ballpark. But most people guess something like 10 or 20 years lower than is actually the case. We've got a great pessimism about there being huge <laughs> swathes, you know, poor parts of the world. But life expectancy globally, on average in 2019, was, drum roll, 72.6 years. And what that suggests is that, you know, most people in most countries are living long enough to start to experience some of these problems of old age. I think you say that a 20-year-old today is more likely to have a living grandmother than a 20-year-old in the 1800s did of having a living mother. So we're, we're yes. multi-generational now in a completely new way. Yeah, and it's. I think what's what really surprised me thinking about this is just how 
we sort of look at our lives, our three stage lives, you know, we've got education, we've got work, we've got retirement. And we sort of imagine that that has been the state of things for much longer than is actually the case. And uh, one of the examples is the state pension age in the UK. That was first set in the 1920s at age 65. It was a handful of people who were even making it that far. And then, you know, what you could expect at age 65 in the 1920s was to sort of, you know, live on for a few more years in terrible health. That's why the state started handing out money to try and look after you because you were just too unwell to work. And yet, that number, 65, has stuck with us for such a long time. Uh, the UK state pension age for men first raised in 2019, so almost 100 years later. And, you know, by 2019, by today, you know, if you're 65, you can expect to look forward to probably a 20-year retirement, you know, probably a decent fraction of that in good health. So it's just incredible how, you know, we live in completely different conditions to when these sort of ideas were first set. And yet we think that it's been like that forever. From a biological point of view, is there any intrinsic limit to human life expectancy? I don't think there is. And, you know, I'd, I'd hark back to the example of the tortoises. It's, it's clearly not a rule of biology, like a law, that we have to age, that we have to de degenerate with time. And so I don't see any reason why humans should be sort of exempt from that. So, you know, I think if we were to freeze current medicine at its, at its, at its current level, then, there, you know, there obviously would be some kind of ceiling. But I think if we can start to implement some of these tricks to, you know, push ourselves a bit more towards negligible senescence, it's very hard to know where the limit is. I guess it's back in the 1800s, it would have been unimaginable for people to think that it would be quite normal to live until your 80s or or late 70s. So I suppose the way for us, it seems unimaginable that you might live to 120. Is that being quite standard? You're saying it's it's a similar kind of jump if, if the trajectory keeps going the way it is now. Even if we just continue with this three months a year per year thing, if we sort of eco, you know, eat away at particular causes of death, improve lifestyles, blah, 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 we sort of carry on with this same basic process. It wouldn't be at all surprising if most kids born in the rich world this millennium were going to live into their hundreds. And as, obviously, as you, get, as you were born more and more recently, your life expectancy continues to extend. So that means, that, you know, if most kids born now-ish are going to be living into their hundreds, then that's already quite a big shift. So, yeah, it's, it's just remarkable how this, this revolution is sort of going on in the background, but it's happening over the course of lifetimes. So we don't really notice. We just assume that the status quo is how, it, how it's always been and how it always will be. We know what ageing looks like on the outside, you know, we know what wrinkles, we know the grey hair. What's happening inside our bodies when we age? In the book, I talk about these 10 hallmarks of the ageing process, and that's the, the sort of framework that scientists have come up with in the last, say, 10, 10, 20 years to understand all of the different things that are going on as we age. And it's a variety of different cellular and molecular processes. So it's things like damage to your DNA, damage to your cells, damage to the little uh, components called organelles inside the cells, damage to your molecules, your proteins that make up your body and that kind of thing. All of these things combine together and um, they basically underlie all of the processes that cause us uh, you know, to change as we age. And that's everything from wrinkles and grey hair to the frailty, to the you know, loss of senses, loss of memory, then on to this sort of you know, more grim stuff, the diseases, the cancer, the heart disease, the strokes, the dementia. All of it seems to be caused by the same underlying combination of processes. So when we say someone died of old age, is that accurate? I don't think so. And it's... <laughs> It's remarkable, actually, how comparatively recently, I think it was only like 30 or 50 years ago, it was no longer allowed to write died of old age on a death certificate. And yet, although you now do have to write a cause, and, you know, I think that, that is correct. You know, most people don't just, you know, pass away in their sleep painlessly with nothing apparently wrong with them. There's, you know, it's almost always after a, a lengthy struggle with cancer or heart disease, or, you know, they, they've had dementia for an extended period of time. And there's, it's, it's basically, you know, you can even have multiple of these diseases at once, and it's sort of a competition for which one gets severe enough, fast enough to finally, unfortunately, kill you. But I think the problem is that this, this idea of death by old age has really sort of continued. And so even if, you know, someone in their 80s dies of cancer, you just go, oh, you know, although it was obviously cancer that directly killed them, basically it was old age. And I think that is the wrong way to think about it because, you know, what really happens in 99% of cases is it is one of these diseases gradually becoming severe enough to take your life. What experiment, Andrew, in, in the 1930s first made scientists think differently about ageing and that maybe ageing was something that could be slowed down? Back in the 30s, um, they were starting to do the first experiments into nutrition because, um, I mean, as we were saying actually about the sort of arc of human life expectancy, this was the point at which there was enough wealth, there was a, you know, people were able to finally choose a bit what they ate and so they were sort of wondering, you know, how can we optimise diet? And in particular, actually, they were fascinated by optimising diet and development in youth to try and make children as healthy as possible. 
But as a side effect of this, a guy called uh, Clive Mackay doing experiments in the States, he got a load of rats and he was trying to experiment primarily, as I say, about development. He was seeing what happens if you feed rats a lot less then you know, what happens to them over the course of their life. And the first thing he found was that if you feed rats a lot less, they, they don't grow to be as big. And that, you know, might not have seemed remarkable, but obviously it's good to have experimental confirmation <laughs> of these kinds of facts. Scientists do like to see it, you know, in black and white in the data. But then what happened was as the experiment continued, you notice something really remarkable about these rats that were being fed less food. They lived about 50% longer than the rats that were allowed to eat what they liked. And not only that, but they were living longer in good health. So, you know, they, they just looked nicer is the first thing. You know, he, he comments a lot in the paper. And you find this a lot in like rat and mouse papers looking at these experiments. They often comment on the fact that the animals have plumper skin and better fur. And I guess it just must be <laughs> because that's so overwhelmingly obvious to the researchers watching these little rats scurry around in the cages. They just look great. And what they found was that then when they got to the end of their lives, they did little post-mortems with these, uh, these rats. And they found that, the, that even though these rats were dying so much later, they had basically the same quality of internal organs. It's not as though they were hobbling on geriatric, you know, with not, not even summoning the energy to die. They really were living longer in good health. And so what this shows us is that this, this, this process we now call dietary restriction can slow down the whole of the aging process. Why? And why can't well, it be the that's... other thing that the more you eat, the, the longer you live? This seems wildly <laughs> unfair, to be frank. It's incredibly frustrating, <laughs> isn't it? I, I have to say, writing those chapters, it's just... I mean, the, the worst thing about it, actually, is that writing about dietary restriction and reading these papers about it just makes you incredibly hungry. <laughs> Even when you're reading about these sort of pro concentrated protein pellets that the monkeys were being fed in some of these later experiments, you're just thinking, oh, God, give me a concentrated sugar and protein pellet right now. This sounds delicious. Um, the mechanisms are yet to be fully elucidated, I think it's safe to say, because the problem is that when you eat less, it causes sort of a global shift in your metabolism. But we do have some ideas, and I think definitely one of the ones that's a significant contributor as well is an idea called autophagy. And autophagy just comes from the word meaning self-eating. So it's a process that goes on inside your cells. So what is it your cells are doing? Well, what your cells do normally is they, they build proteins. And I think when we think about protein, you know, often you think of the nutrition label on the side of some food. And that does um, these incredible molecules an enormous disservice because you know, they aren't just some amorphous nutrient. Proteins are the building blocks of our bodies. They're the little nano, sort of nanobots almost that go around, you know, performing all the tasks inside our cells. They're the things that hold a lot of our body together, things like collagen that, you know, hold together our skin and our arteries. So they're hugely important, complex, diverse molecules. So one of the things your cells are doing all the time is building these proteins. And um, if you're eating a load of food, they've got plenty of raw materials to build new proteins from. And that means that they don't bother cleaning up any of the mess. So when these proteins are you know, in use inside the cells, they can get damaged. You know, inside all of our bodies, there are very reactive chemicals, things like oxygen, things like sugars. These are how our cells are powered. So they have to be reactive in order for us to stay alive. But unfortunately, it means they can sometimes go rogue and stick to a protein and they can basically stop that protein working. So this junk accumulates inside our cells. And if we're eating plenty of food, there's not really an incentive to do anything about it. But if, if you cut down your food intake and your body's thinking, I really need to make some more proteins, what it can do is it can start this process I mentioned, this autophagy. It can start you know, gobbling up these broken proteins and turning them into new proteins. It can recycle them. And so the idea is that because it's preferentially recycling these broken proteins, then ultimately that goes on to sort of have this, this virtuous cycle. You're still making the proteins that you need, but in doing so, clearing up some of this junk. So this experiment was first done with rats. Has it been shown to be, be the case with other forms of life that restricting diet will, will have this positive influence on, on longevity? It's absolutely incredible how diverse the species are this works in. So let's, let's go from the bottom of the tree of life, as it were. It works in single-celled yeast, which is the fungus that you use for brewing uh, beer or making bread. It works in little tiny roundworms called C. elegans that are often used in the lab. It works in flies. It works in spiders. It works in guppies. It works in dogs. It works in rats. It works in mice. The, the sort of diversity of animals it's been tried in is just, not just animals, is absolutely incredible. And it has been tried in monkeys as well, which is the one that you'd think would be most relevant to humans because they're they, the, the rhesus monkeys it was tried in they live sort of 20 30 40 years they're close evolutionary cousins of ours what's really frustrating is that there there were two experiments done that's both started in the late 1980s and they you know, concluded in the last sort of 10 years or so and the results are annoyingly ambiguous they found that the monkeys that had reduced diets definitely lived longer in good health but it wasn't clear entirely if they lived longer overall. And there are quite a few little sort of niggling differences between these experiments. The, the effect is just remarkably, um, it's inconsistent. So although it does work in all of these animals, all these different organisms, then, you know, in, in roundworms, it can like 
add 80% to their lifespan. I think, you know, in rats, it's similarly large. And yet, if you look in dogs, I think it's only 16%. And there's just no obvious pattern. So in terms of whether you should, you know, for example, start doing this yourself, I just think the evidence is, it's really, really annoying that we haven't got, you know, we, we can't be sure this is going to work in people. <laughs> people have been doing experiments into this. And the, the, the problem with like the, the, the sort of gold standard experiments is they've just been too short term. So, you know, people can study this for a few years, but obviously what you'd ideally like to do is to have people restricting their diets over their whole lifetime, which quite apart from whether or not it's practical might be massively unethical as well if you're going to start kids on this program. <laughs> um, and what they found is it certainly does make these people look healthier. They get fewer inflammatory markers in their blood. They have less cholesterol. Their blood pressure goes down. But also it comes with side effects. So you find that people get thinner bones, they can get anemia, uh, they feel cold. Like On a far more sort of emotional level, you just feel hungry all the time. Cranky, people, crankiness would be the major symptom, yeah, I'd have to I, say, I in, so in my cranky life. All the time. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you might hope that after a period, perhaps you get used to this lower food intake and the hungriness goes away, but apparently it doesn't. There's a joke in the uh, ageing science community that dietary restriction might not make you live longer, but it'll certainly feel like longer. <laughs> This is Conversations with Sarah Konoski. So, Andrew, scientists found that restricting nutrition leads to increased life expectancy in a really wide range of animals. And so one approach to anti-aging is developing drugs that mimic the effect in the body without the unpleasant side effects of eating less. Another approach that biologists like you are taking is through looking at senescence cells. That's the fancy scientific name for old cells. Why are senescent cells important? I think this is probably the most exciting current idea for an anti-aging treatment. So let's, let's roll back and talk about what senescent cells are. They were first discovered in the 1960s by a chap called Leonard Hayflick, who was watching cells divide in a dish in the lab. And he noticed that after about 50 divisions, they just stopped dividing. And not only that, but they look absolutely weird under the microscope. But even to my untrained eye, you know, you can see these, there's something strange about these cells. They're these bizarre sort of splayed out, splurgy shapes. And so the idea was, you know, They've been dividing a lot of times. They look strange. They're behaving oddly. They stop dividing. Let's just call them senescent. You know, this, these cells are basically old. And so that sort of begs the question, if your cells individually can age, could it be that those cells aging inside your body are what drives your whole body to age? And so what we found in the intervening decades is that basically the answer is yes. A lot of organisms accumulate these senescent cells. And we know that there are a variety of reasons now. So this idea of replicative senescence, where they replicated, divided too many times, that definitely seems to be a thing. Because if you think about, you know, your skin, the lining of your guts, your blood, these are tissues where cells are constantly dividing to replace the cells that are being lost. But there are also other mechanisms by which your cells can become senescent. They can get too much DNA damage or too many mutations. And this seems to be an anti-cancer defense mechanism. So if you've got a cell that's about to divide an infinite number of times, if it just stops dividing, then by definition, it can't become a cancer. And you can also get cells that are just stressed out. They're in a stressful environment in the sort of the stressful place that is the older body. And as a result, they stop dividing. And this might seem like a benign thing, but for the fact that they also secrete this cocktail of toxic molecules. And these molecules' actual purpose is to call over the immune system, is to say, hey, I'm senescent, I'm over here, I'm not doing my job, can you come and gobble me up and you know, get me out of the way? And that's fine in youth, your immune system's very effective, you haven't got too many of these senescent cells, and this whole process you know, works as it should. But as you get older, your cells are divided more times, you've got more DNA damage, your body is a more stressful place generally, and that's enough to mean that these cells are being produced more frequently. You've also got an immune system which is less effective with age, and so it's less capable of clearing these cells up. And the net result of all of that is an accumulation of senescent cells. So the final piece of this puzzle, you know, we've seen that they accumulate with time, we've seen they seem to be bad for the ageing process. Does getting rid of them make things better? And the answer, thankfully, seems to be yes. We've done trials in mice where we've given them what's called a senolytic drug. So that's a drug that kills these senescent cells but leaves the rest of the cells of your body intact. They gave the drug at about 24 months, which again is quite old for a mouse. It's probably about 70 in human years. And they found it made the mice live a bit longer, maybe a few years in human terms. It was a few months for the mice. But again, crucially, longer in good health. So they got less cancer. They get less heart disease. They get fewer cataracts. They can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill. And again, they even have better fur, which is sort of this classic thing that all, all mouse experiments seem to list as a consequence. So it really does seem that removing these cells has a global effect on the aging process. Have there been any trials on humans yet? 
There have, yeah. In fact, um, the first trial started in 2018, and there are now 20 or 30 companies that are looking to start try and commercialise this idea with drugs and various other treatments to remove the senescent cells. And at first, that's going to be for conditions where we know senescent cells are a driver of that particular disease. So that might be for something like arthritis, where you've got these swollen joints that you know are painful as you get older. It's for things like lung fibrosis, which is a condition that, again, um, affects older people quite significantly and seems to be driven by accumulation of these cells. But what I'm hopeful for is that if these trials prove safe, they prove effective, then we might be able to give out these drugs not to people who've got a specific sort of late stage of a disease, but maybe to people who don't have anything wrong with them, apart from the fact that they were born a long time ago and therefore have accumulated these senescent cells. And the idea would then be that it would prevent these diseases from arising in the first place. It would you know, make cancer and heart problems and arthritis less likely in people before they're ill. How far off might that be? I think it could happen in the next 10 years. You know, these trials are already happening, as I said, so it could only be a few years before we approve these things for specific diseases. Um, the, there are a variety of questions as to how long it will take to get us to the point where it's going to be you know, handed out generally. One of them is scientific. I guess we'll just have to see if it works because as, as we know in drug development, there are so many things, you know, we've cured cancer in mice so many times and it somehow doesn't quite make it to humans for reasons that often aren't entirely clear. And secondly, there's a regulatory challenge which scientists are working on, which is that currently it's very hard to get a drug approved if what it does is it treats aging rather than treating a specific disease because regulators want to say, okay, we're going to approve this drug for this, what they call it an indication. We're going to say, you know, for diabetes or for heart disease or for whatever it is. And so scientists are working on, you know, explaining to regulators and trying to come up with frameworks within which we can, you know, we can basically hand out pills to what would currently be classified as healthy people. One experiment performed by biologists investigating ageing sounds sort of like a, a horror story mashup of Frankenstein and Count Dracula. What is heterochronic parabiosis? maybe the greatest euphemism in the history of science. Um, so let's break those words down. Heterochronic, which means different ages, and parabiosis, which literally means living beside. Um, what it actually means is that you get two mice or rats or other animals of different ages. You slice open their sides and you sew them surgically back together. And over a period of time, these wounds will heal, but they'll heal in such a way as the mice or rats end up sharing a blood supply. And luckily, it's good news for the older animal in the pair. So it basically makes that older animal biologically younger. It rejuvenates the ability of its stem cells to, to basically heal wounds. So if you make a small injury in the older mouse, it will then recover much more quickly than an older mouse that isn't joined to a younger mouse or an older mouse that's joined to an older mouse that you can use as a sort of control for the experiment. And obviously, the idea isn't in the long run that we're going to be you know, attaching grandmothers to teenagers and stuff like that to try and extend our lives. The idea is that could we somehow encapsulate whatever effects are going on inside that in a pill and is it the blood? Is it the fact that that older mouse is accessing the blood of the younger mouse that's, that's providing the benefit? What is it that's, that's good about young blood? That's the really compelling narrative that the media picked up on, because obviously there's this idea that, you know, if you could just inject yourself with the blood of virgins, say, <laughs> then, you know, maybe that could go on to improve your lifespan. And actually, this is something that it's, it's been quite famously used in Silicon Valley, sort of biohackers and tech CEOs seem to be quite interested in this idea. Unfortunately, the sort of simple blood exchange... I think it's basically been blown out of the water, simply transferring the plasma, which is the sort of straw coloured part of blood that doesn't contain any cells from young mice to old mice, doesn't really do anything. It doesn't make them live longer. It doesn't improve their health. So clearly this sort of basic version isn't sufficient. But some companies have tried to cash in on this. Um, but as I say, you know, it's, it's kind of remarkable that this has continued to be, to be seen as a commercially viable venture when actually the, the best experiment you can do in mice shows that it doesn't really work. And the reason is, when you, when you sew two mice together, they're doing a lot more than just exchanging blood. You know, the, the old mouse has access to all of the younger mouse's organs. So the young mouse has got a great young heart, great young lungs, and that means there's a lot more oxygen flowing through that blood. There's, you know, the, the, the muscles, all the organs of the old mouse are going to be better oxygenated as a result. It's got a young liver and kidneys to help out. So, you know, clearing out toxins out of the blood and therefore, you know, clearing toxins out of the whole body. The most fascinating suggestion that I came across when chatting to the scientists who are doing this experiment. Uh, a, a lot of this is being pioneered by a couple called Irina and Mike Conboy, who are this married couple in the US. And what they've they observed is that the, the young mouse, so, so if you have a young mouse and an old mouse, young mice love to run around their cage, they get a lot of exercise, whereas old mice they tend to be a bit more anxious, tend to be a bit more sedentary. And so when you sew these two mice of different ages together, the young mouse basically drags the old mouse around. And that gives the old mouse effectively an enforced exercise program. And so obviously we all know how good exercise is for our health. So it's no surprise that this has this sort of knock-on effect of improving the old mouse's health. So what you need to do is sort of try and disentangle all of these different things that are going on. 
the fundamental and exciting result from that experiment is that it shows that um, the cells in the old mouse aren't somehow like fundamentally decrepit. They're somehow able to reawaken this rejuvenative capacity that the cells still have. So it's possible if we can work out, you know, what factors in the blood, either in the old blood are suppressing the regeneration or in the young blood are encouraging it. And if we can work out how to do that, as I say, without sowing, you know, people or mice or whatever together, then that's the goal of, the, that's the idea of the research. Have scientists found a gene for ageing? For a long time, this was basically thought to be impossible. Because if you think about you know, the evolutionary idea is, is basically that ageing is an evolutionary accident. Evolution doesn't bother putting energy into maintaining our bodies into old age because it needs to look at reproduction. And so it could be that, you know, tens or hundreds or even thousands of genes are responsible. So, you know, for a very long time, scientists just weren't convinced that changing a single gene could make any difference at all. But I think what's really sparked the modern revolution in ageing biology was the revelation that that is actually possible. And this first happened in a, a nematode worm called C. elegans I mentioned earlier which is a really common what's called model organism, often used in the lab. Um, it's much, much simpler than us, and therefore you can do experiments on it and then try and extrapolate, try and understand it in this sort of simple system and work out what that would mean for more complicated organisms. And really importantly for ageing biology, these little worms, they're about, you know, they're a few millimetres long, so obviously you can get loads of them on a tiny little dish, and they only live about two weeks normally. So obviously rather than you know, sitting around for 90 years doing a human longevity experiment, and, you know, heaven forbid, even longer if it works, you can then, uh, you know, get hundreds of worms just in a couple of weeks and work out exactly what's going on with their lifespans. And what we found actually, the culmination of this research is that by changing a single letter of the worm's DNA, which disables a particular gene, you can make these worms live 10 times longer on average, which is just absolutely amazing. And you might think, you know, this is some weird quirk of nematode biology. It's not something that's possibly going to be applicable to people. And I'd probably have agreed with you until about five years ago when a study was done on um, a group of Amish people in the U.S., and what they found was that a single genetic change in this population that had only persisted because it was this sort of small, isolated population of people, they found that a single genetic change could increase their life expectancy by about 10 years. So obviously you've got to be a bit cautious with that. This is a you know, unique, isolated community. It might not generalise to the rest of us in the rest of the world or you know, if we're not living that Amish lifestyle. But still, it just shows you that you know, we shouldn't be disheartened by this idea that evolution would have made ageing, you know, intractably complicated. You can make single letter changes to DNA and radically change lifespan. So do you imagine, Andrew, that there might come a day where there is a single pill or, or a single injection to cure ageing or treat ageing? I don't think so. And when I talk about a cure for ageing, the reason I use that phrase isn't because I imagine it's going to be a single pill. It's not because I imagine it's going to be in, you know, here in five years' time. It's because I want to normalise the idea that ageing is something we should be curing. I don't necessarily want to call ageing a disease. That's a sort of a separate debate. But, you know, irrespective of that, whatever you want to call ageing, I think it's something we should be seeking to do something about and, you know, ultimately go on to cure. I think what a cure for ageing is going to look like whenever it manifests is going to be a whole um, portfolio of different treatments. So I've talked about these 10 hallmarks of ageing. I think we're going to have to tackle, you know, at, at least a few of them before we start making serious headway on ageing. And it might even be that we have to tackle all 10 of them and perhaps even all 10 of them in multiple different ways. And some of those things are going to be pills. Some of them might be gene therapy. Some of them might be stem cell therapy. And when ageing ultimately is cured, whether it's, you know, in 50 years or 100 years or however long in the future it is, it's going to happen. It's, it's, it's going to be sort of life by a thousand cuts in the sense that, you know, someone in this society where ageing is going to go on to be cured might make it to 100 and suddenly there'll be some more breakthroughs. And that will mean that they effectively you know, extend their life expectancy by 20 years. And what that does is it buys more time for more therapies to be developed. So they might make it to 160, which obviously they wouldn't have done in the case where those therapies hadn't been developed. But then we develop a few more treatments, perhaps we cover a few more hallmarks of ageing or come up with a more effective treatment for some of the hallmarks we've already got treatments for. And suddenly, on their 160th birthday, their life expectancy is extended to 200. And that then means they've got another 20 years for those treatments to be developed. And so on and so on. And so, you know, you, you might be born expecting to die at a particular age, but slowly these treatments are going to be developed and your, you know, your funeral is going to be receding into the future faster than you can chase it. So when we do eventually cure aging, I don't think it is going to be one miraculous discovery, one miracle pill that means that we just become negligibly senescent. I think it's just going to be a series of developments that happen, you know, that happen more slowly than we think. It's not going to feel like a revolution if you live through it. I think the clearest example of, you know, this, this, that can't, that what I've just described can sound a bit fantastical. 
But if you look uh, through history, this is exactly what's happened. So people who were born in the 1930s, they were born at a time when hygiene and improved public health were really suppressing infectious disease. And then, you know, vaccinations were already starting to come into widespread use. Then, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years, antibiotics were developed and started to come into use as well. So kids who survived in the 1930s and 1940s were then able to live up into the 90s and 2000s. And what happened then was there was a revolution in this, you know, late life care. And I was absolutely, I was awestruck by what's happened even just in cardiology when I was doing research for the book. Like we, we didn't have CPR in the 1950s. So that, you know, the idea of chest compressions of, you know, breathing into someone's mouth to try and keep them alive if, they have, if their heart stops. That just seems so basic. And yet it wasn't in widespread use, you know, even as recently as the 50s. People who, you know, survived childhood because of the reduction in infectious disease in the 30s and 40s were then able to benefit from these heart disease treatments, from these cancer treatments, and live even longer still when they reached, you know, older age. So this is something that's already happening. And I just see that as sort of an extent, this, this idea of, you know, curing ageing is just an extension of that into the future. If talked about how biologists studying ageing in mice comment on their glossy, lovely looking fur and, and plump faces. What do you think humans... If we live to 150 or 200 routinely, what might we look like? I think if we actually cure ageing, we'll look like young adults for our whole, you know, for a substantial fraction of our lives. Because as I mentioned earlier, like these hallmarks and these ageing related changes, they're all basically the same thing. So whether you're trying to cure disease or whether you're trying to treat the more superficial cosmetic signs of ageing, effectively, I think we'll end up doing, um, you know, we'll, do, we'll end up doing one by accident by doing the other. So I was speaking to a scientist who was really interested in um, changes in our proteins that cause our arteries and veins to get less elastic with age, which is one of the problems that causes high blood pressure, obviously goes on to cause a whole swathe of other diseases. And she was saying, you know, if she had to choose one avenue of her research to really pursue, it would be looking at the stiffness of the arteries with age, because obviously that's one of the biggest killers in the modern world is high blood pressure. But what would probably happen is very much the same techniques to rejuvenate the collagen in your arteries would also rejuvenate the collagen in your skin. And it's the changes to the collagen in your skin that make it less elastic, make you get wrinkly with age. So I really do think that, you know, these things go hand in hand because they're all caused by the same underlying biology. So I'm just trying to kind of catch up my understanding of, of what you're suggesting our futures might look like. And could it be that that science progresses to a point where, like the tortoise, we just stop ageing? I think that is going to be the ultimate end game of medicine. And I would be... I, I'm a scientist and I absolutely hate putting numerical predictions on anything, but I would be astonished if we, you know, if, if, if I could time travel to the year 3000 and people were still dying of old age, my mind would just be blown. I can't imagine that that's how, you know, human civilization is going to play out. Whether that cure for aging is going to happen maybe in time for some people alive today, maybe in a couple of generations time, I, I don't want to, you know, try and put my chips down on the table because I don't think we've got the evidence. But surely that is how we're going to end up at some point in the not too distant future. And so if we don't, encounter an accident or some disease that we don't have treatment for will be immortal. I'm always very hesitant with the word immortal, partly because it just freaks people out. It sounds weird. It's I'm like freaking out, Andrew. I'm 100% <laughs> freaking out. <laughs> but, you know, like Harriet, we might just end up having a random heart attack or, you know, even people in their 30s get cancer. You know, you can still get hit by a bus. You can still get an infectious disease. Yes, you will live a lot longer in good health, but I think immortality it's probably off the cards, you know, until we're into this far sort of stranger world of things like uploading your brain into a computer where it can be backed up. And that's, you know, I, I just find, I find that quite weird, to be perfectly honest. What I want to do is, you know, maintain health until later in life. But wouldn't it be radically different to be a human if we weren't thinking later, if I'm lucky, when I'm old, I'm going to die? I don't think it would make any difference, or at least not much difference. Because I think people mainly, and I, you know, I very much include myself in this, I think most of our lives are lived, you know, maybe not entirely day to day, but when I wake up in the morning, very little of you know, my plan for the day is dictated by the fact that I know I'm going to die in you know, 60 or 80 or 100 years time, however long it's going to be. And you know, very little of it is dictated by the fact that I'm going to age. And when you ask someone out on a date or go for a promotion at your job or whatever it is you're doing, it's it's just so rarely driven by the sort of full arc of the 80 or 100 year lifespan you're expecting to live. Ultimately, life just throws too many curveballs for you to really meaningfully plan over like extended time horizons. So I think people probably wouldn't change so dramatically in their outlook because it's not as though we do consider death that much on a day to day basis now. And I think if it were pushed back further into the future, actually, you know, obviously it would change fundamentally what it means to be human. But I think on a day to day basis, it wouldn't change that much. You know, it wouldn't change as much as people think.
What about overpopulation, Andrew? If we're all living so much longer, people still want to have babies. Is that just not make many more humans than we can we can support on a planet? This is the question I get most often when you tell people you're writing a book on aging biology back at you know, back when we used to go to dinner parties and weddings. But what people would first ask me was, you know, what about all the people? And it's it's kind of funny to me um, because. You know, you might expect someone's first question to be about the biology or to, you know, because it's genuinely fascinating medicine. But I think, you know, I, I can understand this. I actually, when I was um, at the end of my physics PhD, one of the other things I was considering doing was going into climate science for exactly this reason. I'm genuinely concerned about the footprint that humans have on the planet. And I answered this question in a variety of different ways that went about overpopulation. I, I don't think it's a sufficient moral objection to try and stop research into aging. The first reason is that I really hate the phrase overpopulation. And I know it's hugely widely used, but the, the problem is, Using that word blames the individuals, blames the population, rather than blaming the resources that they use. So I think this is a problem. Firstly, it's a problem we're going to have to solve anyway. And the fact that we've got a few extra people will make it harder, but it's not going to make it sufficiently harder to you know, ultimately really concern me. But I would happily work harder to solve problems like climate change and land use if it meant that we could get rid of what I characterise as the, the greatest cause of human suffering. It's the single leading cause of death in the world today is ageing. And that's only going to increase as life expectancies around the world get longer. So the fight, that sort of brings me into the final point that I often make, and this applies to a lot of the moral and ethical objections or sort of challenges to treating ageing, and that's to imagine reversing the question. So imagine we lived in a society where we didn't age, we were negligibly senescent, you know, we were a species of tortoises or something, and we were staring down the barrel of a massively overpopulated world, we had 20 billion people, we were absolutely ravaging the environment. I just don't think you'd invent aging to solve that problem. I think you'd try and reduce your carbon emissions. You'd try and re- you know, change your diets in order to use less land. You'd try and change the amount of resources that you used. If you tried all of those things and you ultimately did come to the conclusion, you came up with the idea there's nothing we can do apart from kill people. It's the only way. I wouldn't do it with like a 20 or 30 year extended period of degeneration during which you lose your sight, you lose your brain, you, you know, gradually get these horrible diseases in combination that eventually go on to kill you. I'd far rather just be, you know, put to sleep effectively. And so I'm absolutely not advocating that. But what I'm saying is you wouldn't invent aging to solve overpopulation. And so if you reverse the question to you know, the situation we're in now, I wouldn't stop aging research to try and save us from this sort of what I think is a bit of a mischaracterized threat. What about inequality, Andrew, which already exists so markedly with healthcare? You know, could one scenario be that a group of Bay Area tech executives have access to these anti-aging drugs and the rest of us are like worker ants who are still dying relatively young? Obviously, we've really got to keep an eye on how these technologies are priced and how they're distributed. The first thing I'd say is that this, this objection, this sort of worry is mutually exclusive with the previous one. So we can't simultaneously have a handful of billionaires being the only people living for a long time and have overpopulation. It's important to like not, not mush them all together into one massive overarching but impossible fear. Um, there, again, there are a variety of ways to tackle this question. The first of which is some of these anti-aging drugs are going to be very cheap. So a leading contender that we haven't talked about actually is metformin, which is a diabetes drug, which, which shows some indications that it might work to slow down aging globally. And metformin costs pence per dose. It's off patent, so you know you can just produce it generically. It costs basically nothing. And so some anti-aging drugs will fall into that category. And then when you look at the other side of the equation, aging is one of the most expensive things. Not only does it cost our healthcare systems a huge amount in terms of drugs, in terms of care, it also has these huge indirect costs on the economy. So, you know, if people get ill, they obviously give up work themselves, but also people can give up work to look after their aging friends or relatives. And, you know, when you add together all these costs, aging costs the global economy trillions and trillions of dollars. So if we could save even a fraction of that by investing in these anti-aging treatments, I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a tough case not to make them universally available unless they're very, very expensive. Andrew, it's so fascinating. There's so much in what you're saying that demands attention and thought. I'm wondering about your own life and that shift from physics, from studying you know, the cosmos and and the biggest order of time to the work you do now on human life and our own time scale. You know, that that little boy who went out and looked at the stars with his mum and the scientist that you are now, where's the connection for you? I think it's strange when you consider the... um the contrast between the timescales that are relevant to the universe and the timescales that are relevant to geology and stuff like that, and then the timescales that are relevant to human lifespans. And then obviously you can go right to the other end, you know, the timescales that are relevant to atoms and molecules that are measured in nanoseconds sometimes. We lie in both sort of physical size and in 
temporal extents, a sort of length of time, right in the middle of the scales of the cosmos, which is really fascinating. On a on a far more personal level, I I really love astronomical events. I, th- I think they're incredibly cool and. I just like to live a bit longer to see a few more of them because some of these things are so rare. You know, I would love to see a supernova light up our skies and probably the best candidate star to go supernova is a star called Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion. That's probably going to go supernova, we think, maybe sometime in the next 100,000 years. So we're going to have to get pretty lucky for that to happen in current human lifespans. And a, a slightly more achievable goal, I think probably the most exciting astronomical thing that I've seen so far in my life was an event called the transit of Venus, which is where Venus passes in front of the sun. And somehow I wasn't even aware of this in 2004, but in 2012, it happened for a second time. It happened just after sunrise in the UK. So we all went to a a little field outside Oxford and we waited. Eventually, in the final few minutes when Venus was in front of the sun, the clouds parted. We saw this little tiny black dot moving across the solar disk. It's honestly the most exciting edge of my seat bit of astronomy I've ever done. The problem with transits of Venus is they occur in these pairs separated by eight years, but they then have this enormous gap in between the pairs. So the next one is going to be in December 2117. And so that's probably a bit too long given human life expectancies now. But I think, you know, perhaps if we get lucky with anti-aging treatments, then that is something, you know, a sort of short-term goal. I could hope to try and see the next transit of Venus. So... (laughs) I hope you do, Andrew, and you can Thank you. you can tell whoever's sitting in my seat about it because I don't think I'll be here, but, but I hope you get to. Thank you so much for being my guest on Conversations. Thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. For more like this, hit subscribe or check out the ABC Listen app for podcasts ad-free. 